Hello, everybody. Good morning. My name is Jacob Avila. I'm at the University of Kentucky. I do some ultrasound stuff there, uh, but I'm also a regular doctor. Um, and I wanted to talk about a non-ultrasound topic today. So I was fortunate enough to talk to you guys about traumatic eye injuries. Now, what we're going to talk about is a couple of things. We're going to talk about what to do about eyelid trauma. Um, some things that I want to spend a little more time on is the cornea itself. I know we don't always think about that as like trauma, but it's ocular trauma, and it's something that we often are going to see. Talk briefly about penetrating trauma, blood in the eye, and then problems behind the eye. So with any kind of ocular complaint and anything in general in emergency medicine, you've got to think about doing a full examination on these patients. Look at the external eye, see if the eyelid is, it has fat extruding, the eyelid margins aren't connected. Look at the pupil, see if it's fixed, if it's dilated, if it's irregular. That would all clue you in to something that could be bad within the eye. In the anterior chamber, we think about hyphema and hypopion, but looking at well into the anterior chamber can actually help you see if you might actually put the patient at a higher uh, likelihood of having something like a vitreous or retinal detachment if you look for cells and flare in the anterior chamber. Visual acuity and the visual fields are obviously very important to look for. With your pressure, this is something that we might not necessarily think about with ocular trauma, but when patients have a significant amount of blood or debris in their eye, that can actually clog the outflow tract to the eye and give them a secondary glaucoma, so something to look for, and the fundoscopic examination. Now, the fundoscopic examination is a little bit difficult to do just in general on like a normal patient, um, but still try to do it even in your traumatic patients. And if you can't and you know that the patient doesn't have a ruptured globe, I often go ahead and use the ultrasound to look at the back of the eye. It's very helpful in that case. The extra thing with traumatic eye complaints versus non-traumatic eye complaints is make sure to look well at the extraocular muscles. Make sure that they're able to move their muscles in all directions because they can have occult blowout fractures of the eye with entrapment of those extraocular muscles that you need to definitely do something about. Let's talk about the eyelid. Now, the margin, if you get a laceration, it's outside the margin of the orbit. It's something that you really don't need to worry about. It's just a regular old laceration, just repair it. There are a couple of situations in which you need to consult ophthalmology because we need to have their expertise in fixing that eyelid laceration. And that is any time that you see eyelid fat extruding out of that eyelid. Now the reason why is because the eyelid fat that's actually on the inside, on the inside of the eye, and if that's poking through, it means it's a full laceration and that needs ophthalmology to fix. If it's near the cannulicula or the lacrimal sac, that's something that if you repair that wrong, they'll have chronic issues with that eye and it'll It'll be awful for the patient. Medial canthus, if it's within about five or so millimeters from that medial canthus, even if you don't see a laceration at the uh, outside part of, the, of the, um, the duct, the patient can still have damage to that duct, and so you need to make sure to have ophthalmology see that. If the eyelid margin is ruptured, Obviously, it's something that ophthalmology is going to need to connect well because if you uh, try to repair it and it's kind of offset there, they might have significant issues with the cornea itself afterwards because the eyelid is not closing well. And then the one thing that I, I guess when I was doing this or researching this lecture, I didn't really think about is ptosis. So if the patient has ptosis of the eye, that could actually mean damage to the muscles of that eyelid or damage to the tarsal plate as well. So these are all criteria for opto fixing that eye rather than you fixing that eye. Let's talk about corneal abrasions. Now these corneal abrasions, this complaint is about 10% of all eye complaints. So it's very common. And it's most common in young adult males. And I like to think, you know, they're the guys that don't like to wear eye protection when they should be wearing eye protection, right? And these, the one thing to think about is irrespective of what you do or what happens, the patient is normally going to, it's gonna heal within one to three days. I was in my garage, I'd, I finally learned how to drill shelves into cement, so I was super excited. I put a bunch of cement shelves up and I was using one of the electric blowers to blow out all the cement and I felt something go in my eye and it kind of irritated a little bit. I blinked a little bit, I was trying really hard not to rub my eyes and it wouldn't go away. I went to the bathroom and I saw a little piece of cement right in the center of my cornea and it was, it was actually pretty painful and I couldn't get it out, I couldn't get it out. My wife, who's a PA, um, I was actually getting ready to go to the, uh, the ER to get some tetracaine because I couldn't, couldn't wipe it off. Um, she took her um, contact lens solution bottle, had me lay backwards on the sink and just flushed it really hard and it came out. Um, so this happens even just doing something simple as like just using a blower and uh, trust me, it doesn't feel good, it hurts. 
Now, the way that I like to evaluate these patients is obviously you have to give them some tetracaine and you have to look with a fluorescein with a little dye, the fluorescein dye. If it's bad enough, you can usually see the corneal defect, but often if they're small, you need to use this and a Woods lamp to identify that abrasion. Now, imagine that this uh, little 10 cc syringe of saline is the tetracaine, the topical anesthetic. The way that I do it is I actually use that topical anesthetic as the solvent for the dye to put it into the eye uh, without actually touching the strip uh, into the eye. So I just basically go like this and drip it into the eye. It kind of eliminates the step for me and um, patients love it when, when their eye is numb. You stick that wood la woods lamp on there and you're looking for any kind of a retained dye basically because that thing will sit inside the corneal defect and that's how you can diagnose a corneal abrasion. Always look for foreign bodies. Um, look in the back of the eye there. I always on all my patients evert the upper and the lower lid as well to just make sure there's nothing else in there. I don't know if you guys can see but this patient uh, ended up with a little ant in their eye uh, as a cause of their complaint. Um, so just make sure that you take those out because that would obviously you could you'd fix it, send them home on antibiotics and stuff, but they would continue to have these uh, corneal lacerations. Now let's talk about treatment. This is something that I did not really know can be fairly controversial. So initially, like in the past, we used to think a patch might be a good idea. Um, the idea was is that it uh, decreases blinking, so you're less likely to irritate the cornea, maybe let your eye rest or whatever. But it turns out that that actually is bad. If you put the patch on there, it decreases the amount of oxygen that gets to the cornea so that the cornea is unable to heal. Additionally, it creates a moist environment, which actually might put the patient at a higher risk for an infection. So patch, definitely don't do a patch. It's not good for your patients. Now, what's probably standard of care right now is to give topical antibiotics. When I had my corneal abrasion, my foreign body with the corneal abrasion, this is all I needed. If I put that erythromycin ointment on my eye, it actually made it a lot better. I put it on about four times a day. It made everything look blurry in that eye. It was kind of difficult to, to walk around. I actually played hockey like that night, and so I had the, uh, the goo in my eye, and I did poorly that game, but I still had fun. Um, if they have contact lenses, you want to give them something that would cover pseudomonas. So like a, a fluoroquinolone um, eye ointment or eye drop would be beneficial for that. You can give them oral analgesics because this is painful. Um, if you're going to give them something, definitely don't give them anything more than 24 hour supply because like I said, within one to two days that's going to be healed. Now what can be a little controversial is the application of topical NSAIDs or topical anesthetics. Now patients have so much relief when you put in that topical anesthetic. They love it and I remember starting on residency, I would just you know, take the bottle away and, and say, I'm sorry you can't have this anymore. When you go home, you're going to hurt and I'm sorry there's nothing I can do about it. The reason for that was because there is this concern about harm coming from the, giving the topical uh, anesthetic. This is a summary from a website of a friend that a friend of mine rubs, uh, runs, Salim Rezaei. It's a great website if you guys haven't been on it yet. But here is the issue, right? You're concerned, they're concerned about corneal abrasion, uh, sorry, corneal ulcerations, keratitis, and they thought that maybe that happens because um, you are unable to see if your eye is getting worse. You might lose some of the protective mechanisms of your eye. This is where the evidence comes from with our reluctance to put topical anesthetic. Notice it's a bunch of case reports, right? It's like under 20 case reports, maybe about only 21 case reports is where this comes from. And if you look at the more recent results, these are all prospective studies. The, the top three, the Ball, Waldman, and Ting study are all prospective randomized trials where they gave people um, topical anesthetic with a placebo. The Waldman uh, study with 542 patients, that was a retrospective study, all found and these were all uh, short periods of time, so it's like one to about four days, all found that if you have it for one to four days, there is no difference in harm done to the patient. There's no worse outcomes if you give them tetracaine, and there are better patient-centered outcomes of pain control. So what I always say to my patients when I send them home with this uh, topical anesthetic is I tell them, please only use this for about one day because if you use it longer than one day, you can, they can take it for more. They can take it for like three, four days actually, but I just tell them one day because I want to be safe. Um, you're not going to come to harm. And like I said, after about a day, they're not even going to need it anymore, right? And you make these guys follow up with ophthalmology. makes me feel better as well. Now with the topical NSAIDs, this is something that I had not really considered before preparing this lecture. Now with topical NSAIDs, this is something that in the past has been... Uh, you know, in the 90s, it was pretty popular, but there was this complaint. It was a big complaint of corneal melting, which like sounds awful, right? The cornea literally melted off and the eye like poked through the cornea. 
So the first uh, kind of time that we talked about it was with this study up top here, this FLAC study. Now this was a bunch of cases that were actually sent in to uh, some organization. It was around 100 physicians uh, that sent in all these little cases of a specific type of eye drop, a specific type of diclofenac from a specific company was apparently defective. Right? So that one was actually taken off the market and past that there have been these cases. So you can see here um, it's a little over 20 cases of this uh, issues with corneal melting which is a big deal. But look at the timing of this, right? All of these had this topical NSAIDs place for long periods of time. Um, some of these up to 10 months of topical NSAIDs before any issue, uh, before any issue occurred. So if we look at these, not really a whole lot of evidence against the NSAIDs. And there have been multiple studies. I mean, look at these ends. Look at these numbers here. Multiple studies that have patients on topical NSAIDs from one to five days, and they found no adverse outcomes with those topical NSAIDs. And as far as patient-centered outcomes, so pain, right? Um, the NSAIDs had a more favorable, they were more favorable than not giving NSAIDs. So you can give NSAIDs and not worry about um, any adverse outcomes like the corneal melting as long as you give it between one and three days um, and it actually is going to be better for your patients. So another option that you can have. Just going to wait for me to take that picture. You got it? Almost. Sweet. All right. Perfect. <laughs> All right, so in summary, yes, topical antibiotics, that is standard of care. You can give oral pain meds if you want. Topical NSAIDs are good, and topical anesthetics are all good. Now, those are all evidence-based, but definitely uh, talk to your local ophthalmologist, talk to the other people in your practice, because you've got to make sure that you're doing what is in your region standard of care, but the evidence points towards topical NSAIDs and topical anesthetics being safe. Definitely don't do patches. Now, let's talk a little bit about form bodies here, like what I had. Now, as far as removing these, one of the things, this actually makes me nervous removing these, but you just, if you think about the technique, it makes it a little bit easier. Now, most textbooks actually talk about using a needle, a 25 or 27 gauge needle, and you gotta come at it at a tangential angle, right? So come at it this way. The reason why you wanna come at it this way is because if you're trying to pick it out from this direction, if the patient like coughs or jumps or there's a, like a loud noise, you might actually just, you know, poke through the eye, you don't wanna do that. But if you're coming at it tangentially, worst case scenario, you just create a little bit bigger of a corneal laceration, right? Um, or an abrasion, hopefully not causing a laceration, just an abrasion. What I usually do initially with my patients, and it works, I wanna say about 70% of the time, is I get one of those Q-tips and I moisten it, so I get it wet, and then I just try to gently take it off after I put the uh, topical anesthetic on there, and it works pretty well. Um, you, don't, you definitely wanna wet it, don't use the dry one, because a dry Q-tip will actually, uh, could actually make the uh, corneal abrasion much worse, because it's very scrapey, and it's actually harder for it to kind of grab that little uh, foreign body. And with these patients, even if it's small, even if it doesn't seem like a big deal, just put them on, anti on topical antibiotics. Uh, because the alternative, it's, there's a low harm with giving these topical an anesthetics, uh, sorry, topical antibiotics, but if they happen to get an infection and you hadn't been giving them topical antibiotics, it's gonna be very bad for the patient. So I just put them on that. Now with the rust ring, right? This is something if you get a little piece of iron in there, this rust ring is something that can be kind of tricky. Um, now, some textbooks talk about really focusing on taking out the entire rust ring because, by the way, this can oxidize. This rust ring can form within like an hour, two hours of that foreign body getting in there. It'll already start oxidizing. Some places talk about, you know, really important, take it out immediately. But some of the other literature, some of the ophthalmology literature, seems to be a little more laissez-faire about it. They actually recommend waiting maybe 24 to 48 hours for that rust ring to kind of finish its business, like finish spreading, and it actually has been shown to um, come out closer to the corneal surface after about a day, making it much easier to just kind of take it out like a plug. So after you take out the foreign body, if they have metal in there, it's okay if they have a little bit of a rust ring. You just got to make sure that you give them the antibiotics and make sure that they follow up with ophthalmology. When somebody has a foreign body, you always got to think about penetrating trauma. Now, for me, I was just using my electric blower in my garage. So the likelihood of that little piece of cement going inside my eye is pretty low, right? But what if I was using like a cement saw or I was cutting a metal pipe uh, with a, you know, a, a sawzall or something like that? That is a much higher mechanism that I may actually have a foreign body in there. So something you always have to think about. Make sure to look at the extraocular muscles, which, which can help. And you can also look for, besides the history, you know, what was the patient doing when this happened, you can look for a corneal laceration or an iris prolapse, which look like this. So on the left side of the screen, we have a corneal laceration, and this iris, pro, uh, iris 
prolapse is something that's intense. We have a pretty robust ophthalmology residency where I work, so we were uh, fortunately able to see, a, I mean, unfortunate for the patient, but fortunate for me because I like seeing weird stuff. Um, this iris prolapse is something that I see fairly frequently, and it's interesting to see in the ophthalmologists. They just love seeing that because it's something that they can fix. Now, this is something that I haven't actually seen yet, uh, but I keep looking for it. Um, this is something called the Seidel sign. So uh, this is that floor scene that you put into the eye, put that woods lamp on it, and if you see that liquid kind of start spreading out, that's basically fluid from inside of the eye coming on the outside of the eye. So if you see any of these uh, symptoms, the iris prolapse, the laceration, or the Seidel sign, what I do, um, some places have a nice uh, little shield that you can put on the eye, but if you don't have that, just get uh, one of those coffee cups, cut it in half, and put that on the eye, and then tape that to the eye just to protect it, because if it's open, um, and they happen to like rub their eye or something hits it, it could make it worse. Traumatic iritis, we have a lot of people that like to play sports while they're drunk in the South, so we have a lot of baseballs and footballs to the eye, and they can get something called traumatic iritis, which is basically when the center part of the eye, where the iris is, um, gets irritated. Now, this is the most common cause of anterior uveitis, and it can be, it's essentially used interchangeably with something else called iridocyclitis, but the easiest way for me to think about it is just traumatic iritis, because that's what it is. Now the symptoms of this is they're going to have photophobia. They have photophobia because the iris is what's bothering them. If they shine light in the eye, the iris moves, it's going to cause pain. Now this pain, one big hint is they may have a history that might be concerning for like a corneal abrasion or something like that, but when you put that topical anesthetic in there, it actually does not relieve the pain. So if you put topical anesthetic and the pain is not relieved, think that it's something on the inside of the eye because the topical anesthetic fixes the cornea. Anything not in the cornea, the topical anesthetic does not fix. Now, as far as treatment, remember I said the iris gets irritated, so you want to give them something so that the iris doesn't move. So give them some cyclopledics, you can give them some cyclopentylate, scopolamine, you can give them steroids, that's prednisolone, one drop every other day. You have to make sure to do a good exam on these guys, though, because if they have a corneal laceration as well as a traumatic iritis, uh, you don't want to give them steroids, because so that can actually make them at a higher risk for getting an infection. So that's assuming that they don't have any defect on their cornea. And then these guys can actually get glaucoma, that inflammation in the uh, in that area can actually cause there to be more cells in the chamber which can actually clog the canal of Schlem, increasing their risk factors for glaucoma. So if they develop these symptoms, you can give them some Timolol as well or other glaucoma, medica uh, glaucoma medications. Now, one thing to keep in mind with traumatic iritis is this often presents one to three days after the inciting trauma, right? So they might not present right after they get hit. They might present like three days later and it could still be from that incident that they had three days ago. Now, these are things that uh, people like to freak out about in, uh, at least, I live in a college town, so these uh, kids that come in and they've, you know, been vomiting for whatever reason, they've been vomiting a lot, and they get these big subconjunctival um, hematomas, and they like to freak out. Even if it's bad, like all of the conjunctiva is just like a little, a big giant thing of blood, these are all self-limiting, there's really nothing that we need to worry about with these people. The only thing to think about is that if it happens to be due to trauma, like they got punched in the eye and got this subconjunctival uh, hematoma, do a full eye exam and make sure there's not anything else going on in the eye. But if there's nothing else going on in the eye and this is all you see, the patient can go home, nothing to worry about. This is a hyphema. You guys see that little like border of red there in the anterior chamber? This is something that can definitely cause an issue. This occasionally can cause enough, uh, you can get enough blood in the anterior chamber that it can actually get uh, all the cells can get stuck in the canal of Schlem, which can cause a secondary glaucoma. Now, when you need to actually worry about this is if it's greater than 50% of the uh, length or the height of the anterior chamber, that's when you should get an op ophthalmology consult. If they're anticoagulated, you need to get an ophthalmology consult. If they have sickle cell, those guys have a much higher likelihood of a hyphema causing a glaucoma, and if they have any evidence of glaucoma. So if they have any complications other than less than 50% of that anterior chamber full of blood, they can go home. They should follow up with opto still because after the fact, they're still at a higher risk. The, it varies in, uh, varies in the literature from 6 to like 33% of patients with any kind of hyphema eventually getting a glaucoma. That even 6% is high enough for me to say like, hey, you should probably follow up with opto in 24 hours, but it can be as high as 33%. There is some kind of anecdotal evidence that they do a little bit better if you sit them upright. Um, so when they go home, like sleep in a chair uh, for like one to two days. It's not great evidence, but it's something that you can tell the patients to do. 
Now let's talk about stuff in the back of the eye. Um, there's a, we're going to do a couple of quick hits on each of these topics here. We kind of already talked about ruptured globes, so I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Although at the very end, I'm going to tell you a little trick about how to get into an, uh, to actually look at the eye to see if you have evidence of a ruptured globe in someone that has an eye that's swollen shut. So retrobulbar hematomas are things that look like this, usually diagnosed on CT scan, but you can usually, you can diagnose this on physical exam by basically seeing that that eye just basically proptosis of that eye in the setting of trauma. Now, this is usually caused by rupture of the infraorbital artery. Um, that's usually the one that is causing the issue with a um, retrobulbar hematoma. And that's important because when you're actually having to release this, you have to think about that it's the infraorbital artery, so you have to make sure to release the inferior canthus to get that out. Now, one of my uh, friends, Jess Mason, runs this great website. Uh, it's a YouTube channel, actually, called MRAP HD, where they talk about how to do procedures, and she was nice enough to let me borrow uh, one of her videos for this. Um, this was done uh, to demonstrate how to do a lateral canthotomy. Now, your first step, if the patient is awake, is to try and anesthetize the lateral canthus. Uh, patients love it when you anesthetize them, by the way. And then after that, you get your Kelly's or your forceps, um, and you go ahead and just stick it inside the lateral part of the eye and crush all the blood vessels in that area. You hold it for like a minute, and that should decrease the amount of bleeding that you have there. And then you want to identify where the uh, crux is and get the inferior canthus. That's what you want to get first is the inferior canthus right there. But if you're having issues, you can't release the eye, you can go ahead and release the superior one as well. So here's a demonstration of it being performed. So this is the first part here where they are crushing uh, the blood vessels in that area. So you can see here they have these force, these Kellys, and he's just holding it there um, to make sure that all the, uh, the blood vessels um, get, um, uh, I guess, destroyed so they don't bleed as much. And then here, um, this person is uh, going into the lateral canthus, and I'll just have you watch uh, what it looks like here. I performed, I think, two of these. So it's a fairly rare procedure, but after you've seen one and see how they do it, it's really not that complicated. It's kind of like a, a chest tube. Chest tubes aren't super common, but they're not all that difficult if you know how to do them. Just kind of get in there and undo it. I'm, so, I'm sorry. I should, probably should have told the AV guys that it was going to be kind of gross. I uh, feel... Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> um, so eventually, this is what it'll look like, and you just let the eye pop out. And that is a lateral canthotomy. You can get a posterior vitreous detachment from trauma, which it's very similar to just a non-traumatic posterior vitreous detachment. Looks like this. You're going to have patients that might have, uh, they're going to have floaters more than flashers. Flashers, you know, where they have those uh, flashes of light, that actually happens more with retinal issues because that is when trauma is actually, when you hit the retina, it actually creates a photomechanical discharge which makes it there be a bright light. But these guys with a vitreous attachment, they're going to have cells and protein in between where that uh, vitreous and the retina is. I like to look at these guys with an ultrasound, and this is, of course, I've already evaluated the patient to make sure they do not have a ruptured globe. After that, um, I put a tegaderm over the eye, and I do that to protect the, the gel from getting inside the eye because it actually hurts. I've gotten gel inside my eye, and it does not feel good. And then you are looking for this. So what you're seeing here is you're seeing that line. Uh, sorry, I went for it, so it gave me the laser pointer. Let's see. There you go. Um, so you're seeing this line here, and you're seeing it's going above that thing right there. That thing right there is the optic nerve. And if you see this line above the optic nerve, that is a vitreous attachment because the vitreous is not connected to the optic nerve. Um, alternatively, what you can see is if you see this, what, this line here connect to that optic nerve right there, that would be a retinal detachment. And I'll show you a picture of that uh, coming up shortly. You can also see a vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, this is really easy to see when you have the patient do something, it's a fancy word called kinetic echography, which is basically you have them just move their eye back and forth. If you see a bunch of hemorrhage in there, it's a vitreous hemorrhage. And then the retinal detachment, they're going to have posterior vitreous detachment symptoms, but they're also going to have some visual field deficits. You can try and do this with your ophthalmoscope, but this is another one that I usually will use my ultrasound for. And this is what it looks like. So remember that white line for the vitreous attachment? It was above the optic nerve, and you can see that this line here is actually attached to the optic nerve. It's kind of flowering out of the optic nerve, and so this is what a retinal detachment would look like. Blowout fractures are something that we have to make sure to evaluate because those muscles can actually kind of get inside the maxillary sinus, the ethmoid sinus, and cause issues. As far as symptoms here, the most common symptoms overall, this is a retrospective review about 700 patients that got surgery for blowout fractures. The highest or the most common thing was peri 
orbital ecchymosis, and they had ocular motility restriction as their, as their most common um, manifestations of it. What's crazy though, which is for me was interesting, is that if you look on the right graph, it, periorbital ecchymosis was present in the minority of patients, in, in minority of pediatric patients that had it. So that's why it's so important to actually do an examination. Like these guys didn't have any, any uh, bruising in their eye and still had a blowout fracture. It's weird, right? So you've got to make sure to, and especially in kids, according to the study, make sure to evaluate those extraocular muscles really well. Now, ruptured globe, this is something that can be tricky if the eye is swollen shut, but one thing that has worked really well for me is to use the, the paper clip technique. Um, so what you do is you stick one end on the, inf uh, the superior eyelid, another one on the inferior eyelid, and just kind of pry it open. And this is how I create that um, paper clip kind of uh, retractors there. So you just open it, you bend one end, and I use the table to help me bend one end. So right here, I'm going to bend that end and get the table in there. Go. And then the back end, I'll open it up to create a little handle for me. And this is so easy, it works really well, and it's really not, it's much less painful for the patient than you trying to use your fingers. Because you use your fingers, you're actually trying to push down into the eye. I appreciate you guys' attention. I appreciate you guys being here uh, so early in the morning, and I hope you have a good rest of your day.